Hey there friends, Dave Polite of Scanner and Missing Project, another copyrighted edition for our video channel. And uh, it's a lot warmer here in northern Montana, it's about 50 degrees, but the wind's blowing at about 30 miles an hour. It gets a little chilly when you go out there, but it's not bad. And it uh, makes it brutal to record in though. And uh, the majority of the snow is gone on the valley basin. But it's cloudy today, decent day. I liked it. And uh, if you haven't been watching, I really wish that uh, you'd tune into the UFO class. I've had a lot of interesting feedback and a lot of great emails. So uh, I appreciate everyone engaging. The uh, I've had a couple of emails from some hunters that are really fascinating. And uh, thank you, gentlemen, for writing in. I'd like to hear from uh, some law enforcement guys and gals and some game wardens out there, because I know you listen. I hear from your family people all the time. But I'd like to hear some of your stories about what you've seen in the wild. That's fascinating to me. And of course, uh, I've written 14 books now. I never release a source. so. If you want your name kept confidential, you got it. But uh, I'd like to hear from you. So today we're going to start off uh, talking about some letters that are good. Some really good ones. Hey Dave, I'm sitting here at 2.08 on an Easter Sunday afternoon listening to you talk about a letter from the man who saw the large white cat that was making speech noises and I was floored. Just 30 minutes prior, I drove to a local CVS in Canton, Connecticut, and I parked, and before I got out of my car, I heard what I thought was two women talking. Very broken English, almost laughable, but I could make out some of the words. Then I thought maybe someone needed help or was injured based upon the changing tone of the voice. As I got out of my car and looked over to where I thought they were, no person was there. There was an island for some shrubs and bushes, and the voice still was repeating, how are you, and what's wrong, and then some cause, and more words. Below a bush was a large black crow, so I walked up to it and thought it would fly away. It did not. It looked at me as if it wanted to engage in a discussion, so I obliged it. Then above my head on a parking lot lamp about 15 high was another crow and it began to talk. It said, stick. And the crow on the bush, crow on the bush jumped up on a rock and pulled out a stick that was on the rock with its beak. This did not happen immediately after the word was said. It took about 30 seconds. At that point I started laughing and some people were looking at me like I was nuts. The crow on the light was eating a squirrel it had flown up there to dine on. It had finished, and then they made normal crow noises and flew off. This was very weird. I've never heard of such a situation like this happen before. Long ago, my grandfather had a minor bird that he taught to speak, but I didn't know that crows could be so verbal. There's so many strange things going on in the wild with animals and people, as well as events. We truly live in weird times. So... <laughs> It's funny, the reason I read that, I, I was laughing the whole time. So when I was about 10 years old, my dad had a, a buddy that he worked with, an older man. It was probably maybe 60, 65, I was about 10 or 12. My dad took me to his house and he goes, hey, you're gonna see something that's really strange. I said, okay. So we get there, and the guy had a crow in a cage, a real crow. And, uh, my dad says, hey, walk over to, to the crow. So I walked over and the crow looked at me and goes, pretty boy, pretty boy. And I thought, that's the first time I've ever seen a bird that could talk. And then the man came in the room and <laughs> the crow started to say dirty things. <laughs> oh, I was laughing so hard. But yeah, crows are, are super smart. And uh, Harvey Pratt, one of my best buddies, the Native American chief, he told me that uh, in his tribe, they call them black 
eagles because they're so smart and uh, they're so effective at what they do. And he's, Harvey always told me that if you're in the wilderness and you see a couple black crows, pay attention to what they're doing. He goes, a lot of times they fly together. And he goes, if they're somewhere, they're there for a reason. Just like those two right there. So, yeah, interesting. Thanks for sharing. Okay. Hey, David. Sorry to intrude on your time. On the 23rd of April of this year, the UK government is going to send a 10-second emergency alert tone to all mobile phones in the UK Sunday at 3 p.m. Does that sound weird to you? Yeah. Why are they doing that? I always think bad things. You know, is it uh, in case that there's an attack? Is there uh, in case that there's some type of national emergency? I don't know. I, uh, <clears throat> I've never been, had a notification like that in the States. If anybody in the States has had something, let me know, but I haven't heard of that. Next letter. Hey, Dave. I'm about midpoint in your latest UFO class on April 7th. I really enjoyed the letter you read about the young girl who loved the rain and who experienced seeing a silver spherical orb floating in front of her a mere 10 feet or so. I plan on listening to this story a few more times. It's very interesting. I too have always loved the rain and although I have a healthy respect for thunderstorms, I find that there is something very intriguing and mesmerizing about them. One thing that came to mind right after listening to your read the letter in that thunderstorms are really aerial lakes. Thunderstorms hold a tremendous amount of water in the three main states of vapor, liquid, solid, most likely in nature's fourth stage plasma. The plasma state of water would most likely occur during a lightning burst. That is, with all the water inside of a thunderstorm, it doesn't take that much of an imagination to describe a thunderstorm as a type of temporary floating, moving lake. As such, as such, Maybe what the girl actually saw was not a UFO at all, but a USO. Something we should consider with all the missing 411 occurrences that happen around bodies of water and or thunderstorms. So, I grew up in California, spent the majority of my time there. And in California, you don't get a lot of thunderstorms. But, <laughs> I moved to... Colorado. I lived there for 10 years. I lived in a small city called Morrison, which is uh, right where the mountains start as you go up towards the Continental Divide. And I had a house that had a view of uh, Littleton and Denver. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't a wealthy area, trust me. I was just happy to have a decent patch of land and I bought the house. But for 10 years, every year during thunderstorm season, I would just sit there inside my house and watch these thunderstorms. They were unbelievable. How they would move, how they would flash. Unbelievable. And the power of them. So everyone knows that uh, pilots, even jumbo jet pilots, are taught never to fly into a thunderstorm. You have to evade them at all cost because their power, they could rip a plane apart. And with Denver International there, I know a lot of times that the flight paths were changed drastically because of these thunderstorms that move over the city. Now, the idea that they're aerial lakes, <laughs> I believe it. And the, if you really think about this, Water weighs eight pounds per gallon. And the amount of water that comes out of a thunderstorm is unreal. And the amount of poundage that is held up in those clouds, pretty unreal on, in that as well. So at the time I was doing some research into lightning. And you know, science really hasn't doesn't have a clear understanding about how lightning is 
generated and pushed out of the clouds. Fascinating to think that something that happens hundreds of thousands of times a year, science can't figure it out. So there's some things in nature that are still intriguing. Enough of that. Hey Dave, I was working for a guide outfitter as an assistant guide 21 years ago, about 60 miles northeast of Bear Lake, British Columbia, back on the 700 road. I was employed as an assistant hunting guide. The hunter I was with and I were back on this deactivated logging road watching an area that had good moose sign. We're positioned in a trench where a culvert had been removed. The site, this Despite my best cow moose calls, no bulls came in. We headed back to base camp after dusk. We were headed east on a 400 Honda Foreman, about to pass through a swampy area where the road was soft and the water from a spring was slowly eroding the road surface. I reduced my speed from about 30 to 20. It was very dark at this point. We were about 25% of the way back to camp. This bright orange rectangle that appeared to be identical in size to the reflector on the back of a quad slowly floated in a stable level elevation some six to eight feet over our heads as we passed under it the amber light was powered somehow the light was as bright as if you were to shine a car headlight on an amber reflector in the dark there was no sound no smell and it freaked me out a bit it made no sense to me. We were alone in a remote wilderness before the time of RC drones. When we arrived at camp, I asked my German-speaking hunter what he thought it was. He just shrugged. I asked the outfitter if any resident moose had been fitted with a reflector. Not that he was aware of. I didn't see a moose, but I was struggling to make sense of it. The next day, we returned to the same area. There were moose tracks, very large, but cow moose? No. I would, have to, I would have to have seen the legs. In the headlights, if this was a moose with a reflector in its ear, cow moose have light coloring on their lower legs. I have not seen any other UFOs since. So let me read that to you again. It was very dark at this point. We are 25% of the way back to camp. This bright orange rectangle that appeared to be identical in size to the reflector on the front of a quad slowly floated in a stable level elevation some six to eight feet over our heads as we passed under it. Okay, that's what I thought it said. First of all, I'm not passing under that. There's no way. I'm going to stop and wait and let that thing change direction. Now, if it flies over me as I'm in a stationary position, fine, but I'm not driving under it. In a lot of UFO stories where people fly towards something or under something, something happens. They lose time. They lose memory it's not good so at least from my limited knowledge I would not do what they did just saying I would probably stop get out my phone and start taking pictures or video and uh, try to get a good memory out of it but I wouldn't I would drive under it just saying But any hunting guides out there, I want to hear from you, especially if you got some good stories from hunters or yourself being in the wild. Hey, David, hope this email finds you well. I have two different encounters at totally different places and states. First was in South Carolina, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the date. One evening during the summer, I went to feed my dog. A light caught my attention for the fact that it was super bright, moving real slow, somewhere around 25 to 350 feet off the ground. It was moving north towards a big swamp that belongs to my neighbor. Best I can describe, it's a funny looking square shape on the back of it and hanging down from it was a rope looking thing 
that was hanging from it as bright as a white light. I watched the situation for 10 to 15 minutes. Tried taking pictures with my phone, but the camera's junk compared to now. It kept going and eventually faded behind a tree line. Weird is all I can say about that. My second encounter was two years ago in Ohio, close to Waverly. I was outside smoking when I noticed a light rising up from a field. I'm really sure in the distance away from me, but no more than 500 feet when it stopped. It very slowly was coming towards my house. The object appeared to be pulsating. It was red, green, blue, and orange lights. I wish you could have seen what I saw. It was very cold, so I went back in the house, went to the second floor, looked out the window and couldn't find it. I was stunned by this encounter. I hope it helps. I've never seen anything like the first incident before or after. Remember, you got a phone. Use it. Take pictures. It's amazing how many times professional photographers see something in the wild and don't take out their phone. So it's not just you, it's everybody. Hard to believe. Hey Dave, I've been appreciating your work since you released the Hoopa Project. Well, thank you. Trivia question, what was Dave's first book he ever wrote? Hoopa Project. How many books have I had published by a publisher? Two. Hoopa Project, Tribal Bigfoot. Then people say, oh yeah, you know, and then he, he had to self-publish his own books. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. And in fact, that's what uh, Wikipedia says. Oh, his books are self-published. I think it's so demeaning. It's hilarious. So you get a very small percentage of a sale if you work with a publisher. If you don't work with a publisher, you get all of the sale. So what should you do? Thank you. And there's a lot of things that go with self-publishing like me. You got to lay out the book. You got to find a layout person. You got to find somebody to do the cover. You got to find a printer. You got to pay for that all up front. You got a publisher. You don't do anything. You just get a small percentage of the total revenue. So it's a lazy way to write, but my way, much happier. Hey Dave, I've been appreciating your work since you released the Hoopa Project. Thank you for everything you've done and continue to do for UFO and Bigfoot communities. I just finished your UFO UIP Class 3 video and you said that you would like to hear more about UFO stories. So I have a good one for you. And this is a good one, folks. And so let me stop right here. It's amazing to me, the people that watch these videos. And I know for a fact, I've had analysts tell me that YouTube is lying through their teeth about my audience and the size of it and my numbers. Because there's no way, <laughs> there's no way the places I go in the middle of nowhere and somebody can walk by me and go, hey, you're Dave Polites. And I could have only this many people follow me each time. It's just... And analysts have told me that my audience is probably two or three times the size that YouTube's reporting. So I'm just saying. But this story that was sent to me, I'm very grateful for these kind of things. You mentioned the Lonnie Zamora incident in New Mexico, and I believe that my grandfather saw the same craft on the same day. Lonnie Zamora was a New Mexico State Highway Patrolman who saw a UFO. And he started to investigate UFOs and unusual anomalies. And he was a very credible source and a great person. So, saw the same craft on the same day, if not the same week. My grandfather was stationed at White Sands Missile Range, not far from where Zamora had his encounter in 64. I've heard that UFOs have been reported to be interested in nuclear weapons and there work certainly some at this installation. Well, obviously he's right about UFOs being interested in nuclear things. In my latest documentary, Missing 411, The UFO Connection, you can watch it on Amazon, iTunes, Apple iTunes, and on Vimeo. 
And you can buy the video of this directly from me at our website, NA, like North America, nabigfootsearch.com. DVDs and Blu-rays I sell. I'm the only one selling those. So here's my grandfather's description of the event in his words. In 64, the radar-guided missile bases in western Washington were being upgraded with better, longer-range equipment, so our personnel had to be trained on the maintenance and operation of these new devices. This training took 10 months and was conducted at Fort Bliss, Texas. After this training was complete, we were sent to White Sands Proving Grounds to spend three months testing our newfound knowledge. This, bay, this base occupies several hundred miles in the New Mexican desert, far from any large city. It used to be used to test highest classified military equipment, and it was operated jointly by the Army, Navy, and Air Force. Anytime, it, at the time, I lived in El Paso, Texas, so I commuted there every day around 4 a.m. I worked with about eight other technicians each morning to have the equipment ready by 9 for radar operators. The operators would spend each day simulating drills, engaging probable hostile aircraft, and perfecting their tracking abilities. After about two months of training, the operators were able to test fire missiles at radar-controlled drone aircraft. After we finished setting up the equipment each day, we would usually stand by just in case the operators needed help with malfunctions. When they occurred, we were there to fix them immediately, and then the operators would continue with their drills. The missile, la the missile launch pads were located about a half mile away, and we were in constant contact with the personnel via radio and phones. The road that went between the radar installations and the launch pads were patrolled by military police 24-7, and they too were in constant contact via radio. If the equipment was working correctly, no problems. We'd usually finish setting up by 6 a.m. and then go have coffee. There was a coffee shack located beside the radar equipment vans and we would usually stand outside and enjoy our coffee while watching the desert sunrise. On one particular morning, just about sunrise, we stood outside drinking our coffee and talking about the upcoming activities of the day when we were startled by a bright blue lit object that descended to the ground about 200 yards away, directly between us and the launch pads. It was circular and it was dome top and it had some kind of landing pods protruding beneath the craft. It appeared to be about 30 to 40 feet in diameter. The object remained motionless, glowing blue and emitted a very high pitched hissing sound. We immediately contacted personnel at the launch pads and they confirmed that what we were looking at. After observing this for about five minutes, three military police vehicles approached with their radios going crazy. We could hear a great deal of the conversation and they were struggling to decide what to do about the mystery craft. A few minutes later, several more military police vehicles arrived, complete with automatic weapons drawn and pointed at the craft. They seemed unsure about a firing on an unknown object when the word came from headquarters not to fire unless fired upon. They were instructed to observe the craft, make sure no one approached it. <laughs> now, you may think, oh, that doesn't need to be said. Hmm. Well, there are stories out there about people who have approached craft and they later disappeared. After about 15 minutes, the craft began to slowly rise into the sky with the landing pods retracting back into the base. Once it reached about 50 feet high, it came to a complete stop and flashing white lights then began to illuminate the outer edge of the craft. Now I know people are going, well Dave, just don't say that the people disappear. Travis Walton, fire in the sky. Watch the movie if you haven't heard of the story. A few moments later, it accelerated at a tremendous rate of speed out of sight, producing a deafening hissing sound. Now, that would have been cool to see. <laughs> Definitely. The MPs instructed us not to go near the landing site or communicate with anyone about what we had seen. They also prohibited anyone from leaving until headquarters gave us the go gave us the go-ahead shortly after this several black sedans with men's in suits arrived presumably fbi or cia cordoned off the site with the yellow keep out tape 
Our commanders arrived at 8 a.m. and instructed all of us, including the MPs, to attend a meeting at headquarters immediately. When we arrived, we were sent to a meeting room full of intelligence officers from the Army and Air Force. We then signed a ledger and took a seat. A major informed us that what we saw was a top secret aircraft that had landed in the wrong place by mistake. <laughs> Oops. When we were ordered not to speak of this event to anyone, including our own family, to prevent harsh action taken against us. Another officer stated, if you don't want to be stationed in Greenland for the next 20 years, keep your mouth shut. An Air Force captain even stated specifically that there was no such thing as UFOs and threatened to take away our military retirement pension. Anyways, looking forward to your next class. Take care. Well, I guess that they really hadn't perfected that craft if it was ours. So imagine you see this craft land in front of you. It's your typical flying saucer. And at the time, this was in the like 50s, 60s. We had something that advanced? We had something that advanced? Well, that would be pretty enlightening to say the least. Now I heard a long time ago that our military has technology and craft that's about 50 years ahead of what we think we have, meaning the public. So in 1960s, I mean, we still don't think that we have UFOs that can fly that fast. There probably are UFOs that we have re -engin uh, reverse engineered, but back in the 50s and 60s, we had that? Uh, that's a tough one to believe. I mean, that's an interesting story, and I appreciate you sending it. I believe your grandfather. But my take on that is, what if it wasn't one of ours? What if it really was a UFO from another dimension? And those intelligence officials just didn't want it to get out that it was landing on military property. To me, that would make more sense. And so they told those guys that story just to calm everybody. And they let everyone think, oh, we're keeping a secret about our own technology. Yeah, we got to keep that a secret. Next one. Hey, Dave, this is regarding the subject of cloaking and invisibility with a theory on how Bigfoot might be doing it. This occurred in the 70s when I was in my 20s. I had been practicing meditation daily for about two years and was acquiring some of the natural psychic abilities that come with spiritual development. Anyone who applies themselves to yoga meditation techniques starts activating the pineal gland, and usually with that comes extra dimensional perceptions. So I was visiting my dad's place where I grew up, 10 acres of suburban wo woods with a creek running through it. The creek had trout and local kids were occasionally seen pathing up and downstream, dangling their fishing lines in a shady deep spot along the rocks. I went to the creek to meditate, found a secluded place near the water. The small area was surrounded by salmon berry bushes and it seemed private. So I sat cross-legged and began to meditate. I guess maybe 45 minutes had passed and I was pretty deep in when I heard voices coming from upstream behind the salmon berries. I knew in moments they would come around the bushes and see me sitting there like a yogi, possibly in an awkward meeting. I remained still, but mentally and powerfully, I put out the thought, you can't see me. Just as they came around the bush into view, I watched one of them as his eyes literally passed over me without a scrap of recognition or reaction. The other two never looked, even though I was in plain view. In fact, one of them almost tripped over me. They were that close. They continued chatting while fishing on the spot for a few minutes. To this day, I'm convinced they really did not see me by powerfully, powerfully suggesting they not see me. Their own brains were blanking out any photon signals of my shape sitting there, almost within arm's length, kind of like editing a videotape on the fly with sophisticated tools. For me, this event was unique. I was never able to replicate it. As I got older, I stopped meditating regularly and gradually <clears throat> lost some of my psychic abilities. But maybe Bigfoot, being highly evolved, uses his ability regularly. 
Maybe they are not camouflaging themselves with some sort of technology, but instead causing the optic part of our brain to omit any data involving their visual presence. Just a theory. Best energies and thoughts to you, Angie and Huck. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Hey, next one. Hey, Dave, I think you're doing an amazing job being open-minded. However, what we see around here is normalcy bias and conformity bias, where people can't allow the truth of the facts into their consciousness. They can't deal with that, so they have to fabricate some fake, normal-sounding story that conforms to what other people are saying, like on social media. They looked it up on social media. Instead of thinking about it and concluding it doesn't make any sense, an official story must be wrong or a lie just because it's official doesn't mean anything. That's my take on it. They can't get their minds around the other possible scenarios and will assume no matter what that it's normal somehow the guy must have been lost. Also to note, I've worked all through the northern Boreal, dropped in by heli. No people, completely safe, no disappearances. Huh? Next one, eight. This incident happened southeast of Kansas City in a suburb. The object was witnessed and photographed by my in-laws. They're in their early 80s. No-nonsense type of people who do not believe in the possibility of UFOs and aliens. On or about March 27, 2021, about 7 p.m., my in-laws noticed through their living room windows their yard in the street in front was brightly illuminated. They have a deep covered porch so the sky is not visible from the inside. They went out onto their porch and the entirety of the undeveloped land between them and Arrowhead Stadium was lit up brilliantly. As the crow flies, the stadium is about a mile away. Low in the sky and described as at least as big as a stadium was a circular light with whitish to the naked eye, but in some of the photographs taken by my mother-in-law's smartphone, it appeared with red illumination. It was steady and at least in place for 15 minutes as they began to observe it and then just vanished. I forwarded you a photo. So this is what it looked like. Pretty weird. Pretty darn strange. Now sometimes at night, if you have real bright lights on the ground, sometimes they'll reflect off the cloud. This to me looks like there's a light, a really bright light in the sky. Not sure what it's about, but thanks for forwarding. That was interesting. Kansas City near Arrowhead Stadium. Now, how many people here know about the Bermuda Triangle? So, Miami, Florida, Bermuda, Puerto Rico. I've been to two out of the three. Been in Puerto Rico a few times. Been to Miami several times. I've been in this area of the world many times. Now, even though the Bermuda Triangle is defined by this, in reality, all of this area down through here is included in the triangle when there are disappearances. But this is the important part. This story has to do with just a few miles north of Miami between Palm Beach and Miami. That's where the story is going to take part. So pay attention. Never before have, have I put this story in a book anywhere, something new that we found. It involved two men, Michael Mergen, 23, and Henry Salvatore, 23. They were missing July 24th, 1990. Uh, they left West Palm Beach aircraft in a Cessna 152 at uh, 7.23 p.m. on July 24th. Still quite sunny outside. Now, Michael, he was a very, very sophisticated flight instructor. He had 650 hours of flight time. 
He was married, had one daughter. Michael's da uh, father was a very successful Boca Raton physician. And Michael was considered brilliant himself. The peers that Michael worked around at the airport considered him an absolute natural pilot with great, great skills for 23 years old. Now, that day, Michael was flying with a man named Henry Salvatore, also 23. Now, Michael and Henry went to high school together. And a lot of people always want to know, well, is there a religious affiliation between this disappearance? I'll give this to you. Henry and Michael graduated from Pro Pope John Paul High School in Boca Raton. Graduated together. And then Michael went on to college and Henry went and moved with his family to Trinidad. Now Henry's family was super wealthy and they had business ventures in Trinidad. So they went there and moved there for a few years. And when Henry came back, they renewed their friendship. And on the 24th of July, 1990, Michael and Henry took a flight together and Michael was giving him a flight lesson. Now let me give you the, the specifics about this because this is important. So they took off at 7.23 p.m. from West Palm Beach Airport, right near the coast. Then about a half an hour later, they started doing touch and go landings at Lantana Airport, just several miles south of West Palm Beach. West Palm Beach is a big international airport. Lantana is a regional airport. So you don't want to be around those big jets all the time. You want to be down here in Lantana, touch, touch and go. Now, that's Michael the pilot, described as a brilliant young man who wanted to be an astronaut. Dad's a physician, comes from good stock, made good judgments in life, was in a good position, had a good family. Now this is, that's Michael and Salvatore, Henry Salvatore. That was his buddy that he was with. Again, Super smart, both of them. Both of them knew each other. They were the same age. Michael's in command of the plane. So they do the touch and goes in Lantana. And then they flew east out over the ocean. And they spent some time out there, not a long time. And then they turned around and came back and were flying back to the coast. Now, there was no local radar on that. But Miami Approach Control had the Cessna 152, which they were flying, on radar. And they were last confirmed at radar at 1,800 feet. And then they were dipping below that as they came closer to shore, probably getting ready to do touch and goes or land again. So when they went under 1,800 feet, they came out from under that radar controlled zone. And Miami didn't have them anymore. Well, they didn't come back to the airport. And they were quickly identified as a missing plane. And the Civil Air Patrol in that region was activated and they immediately went to search. Now, Michael's dad and Henry's dad got involved right away. As would any dad who loved their son. And these dads obviously did a lot. I read several articles about that. It was, it was heartbreaking to read. The Civil Air Patrol decided that they were gonna search from inside out. They knew that the plane was just a couple miles off the coast at Lantana and Boynton Beach so they started their focus there, and then they started to move out. 
they're looking for oil slicks, things on the water, etc., that you would find with a crash into the water. They didn't find anything. Then they thought, well, maybe they crashed on land. So again, they started in that inside and they started moving out and they went out to a 150 mile, an hour, 150 mile perimeter, which in reality seems ridiculous, but they didn't, they weren't finding anything. This went on for the first week. Then the first week of August 1990, in an area near the beach where they would have flown over to get back to Lantana, in an area near Boynton Beach, uh, somebody found a foam steering wheel pad from a Cessna 150. Some people believed that it belonged to Michael's plane. There was no way to confirm it. But that was the only thing remotely found anywhere that could account for that plane. So now, Mr. Salvatore decided that he was going to privately pay for an extensive search of the ocean area using side scan radar. And if anybody's ever seen the sign scan, it just lights up the bottom of the ocean. You could see anything in it. It's, it's unbelievable. So the F Florida Atlantic University donated the side scan in the boat. And the crew was paid for by the Salvatore's. And they worked for weeks side scanning hundreds of miles of ocean. Nothing. How could that be? How could they not find something out there? That's that's beyond my pay grade to not to not understand that. So the fathers were tormented. And years later there were articles written about this case. Let me read you one thing that was said about it. This was written five years after the event. It says, uh, five years later, the disappearance of Michael Mergen and Henry Salvatore continues to baffle Mergen patrol pilots who helped the search. Quote, to have these guys basically disappear off the face of earth, face of the earth is pretty amazing. But we know it's possible because it happened, said Civil Air Patrol Major Bruce Smith of Boca Raton, who participated in the search. Smith, a veteran of 50 searches for missing planes in the past 35 years, has some idea of how families of those who disappear feel. It's an awful, it's an awful hard to cut yourself off from someone you love when there's no answer, he said. No kidding. I know about that. It's horrible. I can't think of anything worse. A couple of things about this. It's just a, just miles outside the Bermuda Triangle, number one. Number two, Michael was not just your average pilot. He was like a super skilled pilot. No radio calls for help. No wreckage on the ocean. No wreckage found in the ocean. No evidence what happened. And like the article just said, disappeared off the face of the earth. But Michael and Henry fit this weird scenario. Both super smart both clean-cut, good young men, athletic, and 23 years old. Kind of fits that scenario where young men who have disappeared and later found in water, but this time they disappeared over water and were never found. So in that, my book, Missing 411, A Sobering Coincidence, 
in a weird sort of way, this case reminded me of that. Well, I read the story. It affected me a lot. And uh, I'm very sorry for those families. I hope someday there's some type of evidence about what happened to these good young men. Weird. Next story. Occurred in the state of Washington. Jason Lovelady, 38 years old. He was from Concrete, Washington. He and his mom and his stepdad were on the Elbow Lake Trail near Mount Baker on October 5th, 2013. And they were there and they were picking fir cones. Several articles made it clear, not pine cones, fir cones. By, by trade, Jason was a uh, truck driver. Picture of Jason. He's a truck driver. He was with his mom and stepdad, who he knew had known his stepdad for years. And they were up in this, this area by the Elbow Lake Trailhead. And in this area, you could see for almost 300 feet through the trees, there wasn't a lot of underbush. This area they were in was between the Nooksack River and Wan Lake Creek, which kind of bordered both areas. Parents said that there were plenty of cones in the area, no need for him to wander off. But there came a point at about two o'clock where Jason said he was going to go relieve himself. And he disappeared, just vanished. There were some Forest Service people in the area. The family contacted them and they looked for Jason till about four o'clock when they contacted the Whatcom County Sheriff. So where is that area? Well, this is the trailhead area. This is Bellingham, Washington over here. This is Burlington, Cedra Woolley, Mount Baker, Elbow Lake right there. Well, the sheriffs get there and they knew that Jason had a five gallon bucket with him to collect the cones. They looked around for that, they couldn't find it. Now his mom's name was Scarlet, Starlet, Love Lady, and his dad was named, stepdad was named Mark Clark. Now they reported that they lost sight of him at about two o'clock. At 4 p.m. they called the sheriff. And search and rescue was called by the Whatcom County Sheriff in force. And right from the get-go, they sent in three dog teams, which is good response. And they, they brought them in on different days. And they also had a helicopter that flew over the area for multiple days. The incident happened in the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest. Search lasted for a week, found nothing. This case was talked about over multiple years because he was never found. Now, Washington has a mandatory disclosure law. What that means is that if you write to them about a case, by law, they have to disclose it. Unless, and they have certain parameters, they say that the case is active. In 95% of all the cases I have requested from the Washington Sheriff's Departments, I've always got them. Now, I wrote to Whatcom County. This case is 10 years old. It's a missing persons case. And they won't release the case. I asked for an appeal so it could go to detectives. They said they contacted the lieutenant in charge of the case and said it was an active case. They refused to talk to me about it. 
and they refused to release any of the reports. Every article I found said that there were no suspects in the case. Now at the time, the sheriff in Whatcom County back in 2013 made the following statement. This is in response to a reporter's question, what do you think about this case? His, re his response was, it's kind of a strange one. This is quotes, quote, it's kind of a strange one. We have no real indication he's here. Okay, what can that mean? Does that mean that they didn't think he was ever there? Even though his mom and his stepdad both said that they were there with him? Is that what it means? Or does that mean that somehow he left the area? I don't know. There was never really any indication of what canines or how they responded to on the incident. Now, Mount Baker is a pretty strange area. And there's a lot of weird things that go on up there. Lots of UFO sightings, lots of Bigfoot activity, lots of weirdness up there. But for Whatcom County to respond in that manner was something that kind of surprised me. In fact, it really surprised me. But it is what it is. It's been 10 years. Jason hasn't been found. Case is still open. And we know what I just said. Now, when I do these type of cases, I try to get as much information in front of you as possible. And every once in a while, people will say, well, Dave, if we know somebody who's missing, what do we do? Well, first of all, do exactly what these parents did, call the sheriff. And try to get the, the U.S. Forest Service involved because that means there's more searches, searchers. If it's in a national park, the national park will just control everything. They control the searching. They control who searches. They, they're very, uh, what's the right word? They're very controlling. You'll have very little impact over what they do or how they do it. Uh, that's all I could say. But if you're in a national forest, 95% of the time, it's sheriff's office that'll have the jurisdiction in the search. And most sheriff's offices are very, very good at listening to the victims and the victim's families. Now, oftentimes, if the search is over, there's nothing to stop you from going into a public force to search on your own. And all searches 95% of the time are done by people like you and me, volunteers. Now, I've gotten a lot of questions lately from people just like you saying, hey, Dave, I want to become a, a search and rescue volunteer. Please do. The vast majority of search and rescue organizations need volunteers to search. And the best way to get involved is just call the local sheriff's office and say, hey, can I have the phone number of your search and rescue coordinator? And that search and rescue coordinator is the person who will tell you how you can join the team. Some search and rescue teams don't involve any training at all. You can just come on and they'll talk to you and they'll give you informal training at their level. Others require you to, re to attend formal classes that are given by different organizations. The biggest organization is called NASAR, N-A-S-A-R, National Association of Search and Rescue and they give classes every year. And then you get certifications to do certain things, very regimented. So it depends on how advanced your local sheriff is and what they require. And most of the time, they need people. And if you have special expertise, they really need you. And if you're a former law enforcement, they'll really need you. So don't be bashful about getting involved. Uh, I would encourage anybody who's in decent shape to get involved. And sometimes you'll, you'll be taken into some areas that, you know, you've got to be in good shape to do this. Don't, don't be out of shape, way overweight. It's not good. 
and don't have any existing knee, back, hip injuries, it won't work. But anything short of, short of that, they're really big on retired people because you then can donate a lot of time. Most search and rescues for people last five to seven days. The reason they don't last any longer, search and rescue people get burned out. They get tired. They need time away. Now for a search and rescue lasting longer than that, it means they're bringing in teams from other areas who don't know the region they're searching and maybe they don't want to bring them in. That's the complication. And then if, heaven forbid, you have somebody who disappears over a holiday. Well, search and rescues people are just like everyone else. They go away for the holidays. They go see family and friends. They're not around. It's a real conundrum. It's a real serious issue when you don't have search and rescue available. So, and since, it, since search and rescue are volunteers, they can't force those people to stay home on holidays. But anyhow, that's the background on search and rescue. I encourage you to go and apply and get involved. But in the meantime, those are two cases. Those are some letters. Uh, some real strange cases here. Three people who have never been found. Please share this video with your friends, your social media. If you like the video, give us a thumbs up. Please make sure you're subscribed. And you can follow me on Twitter, David Politis at Can I Am Missing. I put on two or three tweets a day lately. Truth Social, David Politis at Can I Am Missing. And of course, videos, books, don't buy my book. Do not buy my books on Amazon, eBay, etc. You play two or three times as much form as what I charge on my site. My site is NA, like North America, nabigfootsearch.com. I appreciate you being here. Hope to see you soon. Politis out.